So, uh, hi, I, and we just heard the recording starting. Okay, so hi, everybody. Welcome and um, to our chat here for today. Uh, this discussion is a key step forward in our university's ongoing work to foster a deep sense of belonging across our community. And within the College of Education, we've engaged in a book club uh, last January. This book club inspired the formation of a committee that wants to really work towards integrating concepts from the book here today into our everyday practices. So today's session marks the start of a workshop series designed to explore how we can further support the climate of connectivity and inclusivity for all faculty, staff, and students. And so again, we just wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we would like to learn a little bit about everybody on call with our participants, but first we want to introduce ourselves to you, the panelists for today as well. Um, so we'll start with Suzanne. There, I'm Suzanne Dexwide. I'm chair of the Department of Counseling and Higher Education here at NIU. Thank you. Awesome. Next, Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm the chair of special and early education here in the College of Ed. Okay, perfect. Next, Joe. Uh, I'm Joe Curran, academic advisor in the kinesiology and physical education department. Excellent. All right, David. Hi, everyone. I'm David Walker, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Education. Welcome. All right. Next, Chris. I'm Chris Lowe, Director of Student Success for the College of Education. All right. Perfect. And then last but not least, hi, everybody. My name is Eric Kunko. I'm working as the Director for Equity within the College of Education. So we'd also like to learn a little bit about you, our participants on the call today, as we engage in a discussion about belonging. So I think it'll be important. I'm going to stop my share screen for a moment, just so that everybody can share their name, their position. And we'd like to also hear from you. What makes you feel a sense of belonging and where are places you feel like you belong the most? So again, I'm going to stop my share for just a moment so that we can see everybody and have a short conversation. And what I'm going to do is copy and paste those questions into the chat. Feel free to unmute or you could put your name position and also um, what makes you feel sense of belonging uh, in the chat any volunteers carolyn it looks like you're volunteering maybe well i it was a hesitant volunteer there <laughs> <laughs> thank you um my name is carolyn um and i'm the chair of lepf um, in the, in the college of education and, and in terms of uh, what makes me feel a sense of belonging, I do appreciate working with colleagues and I do appreciate solving problems together. Um, and so, you know, the, the mutual respect that we have for the process and for students in particular really does make me feel that I am contributing to something, which also then kind of backfeeds the sense of belonging. Thanks for sharing. Let's hear from other participants in the audience today. Hi, Daryl. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Daryl Dugas. I'm an associate professor in um, the LEPF department. Also, I'm eating lunch. So I'll be turning my video back off after this, just so mm -hmm. I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to not be gross online. Um, and where I feel it helps me feel a sense of belonging. Um, I think people asking me questions about myself, people showing an interest in me. Uh, people responding, whether it's agree or disagree, but people responding and engaging me with when I when I share something, I think makes me feel a real sense of belonging. Um, I, and I feel uh, like professionally, I'm very much in my program area, I feel a sense of belonging. Um, and in my department as a whole, I feel a sense of belonging. Probably the place I feel the greatest sense of belonging, though, is like with my with my wife and kids. Thanks for sharing, Daryl. Anybody else? Uh, I'll go. Um... Joe Kern, academic advisor. I think it, it, it comes in bursts, but I think the time I feel it the most professionally is every once in a while you'll go through that run of students who come into your office to meet with you and they're like, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with me and help me sort this stuff out or or whatever. Or right around graduation time, I, I students start to express a little bit of gratitude for what has been going on for the last couple of years. And that's always, it's always very nice to hear like, okay, so I haven't just been talking to to the air for the last couple of years when you come into the office. So that's always nice. Thanks for sharing, Joe. I can also jump in as well. I'm, I'm also in the midst of making breakfast or lunch or, or whatever they call it nowadays. Um, but um, I'm Courtney Hutchings, uh, they, them, uh, assistant professor in the higher education um, program. Um, 
I think to for me, honestly, sense of belonging um, is not only um, a feeling, but also an act. Um, I also think about the ways around how um, institutions also have a um, not only an obligation, but a mission to ensure that um, belonging doesn't uh, belonging happens not only for uh, some students, but all students. But I think often what we tend to think about as belonging feels the warm and fuzzies. But I often think about the ways around how structural um, and programmatic belonging is also something that um, is important um, to me as well. And I would say myself belonging uh, for myself on spaces on campus, I think is often where I see students that look like me. Um, and so I often think about, you know, our black students, um, our queer trans students, um, students who are on the on the margins, on the margins. Um, what does it mean for us to center those students belonging um, in order for us to kind of get to the ways around how we think about, you know, Fanny, Fanny Lou Hamer's work around like we're not, no one's free until everyone's free. And I think that that also is connected deeply to what belonging is. Like belonging can't be done until all folks feel belonged on this campus or in any campus as well. So I just want to share that. Yeah, such important points there about what we do structurally to support or undermine everybody's sense of belonging. Looking forward to discussing that more. I can go ahead, Eric. Thanks, Vera. Uh, my name is Farah Ishek. I'm an assistant professor of sport management uh, in KNPE. Um, I would say in terms of feeling a sense of belonging, I think a lot of it for me has to do with the idea of support, right? So understanding, hey, here are some of my some of my ideas. How do I feel like supported within my department? Uh, the idea of like listening to to my ideas and uh, understanding how we can make those possible or make those happen, but also the ability to go in and just uh, speak with someone, ask questions, and just me knowing that. Uh, someone is there to to um, listen or lend an open ear uh, to specific situations. I mean, I think that goes a long way when we talk about uh, the feeling of belonging. For me, a lot of it has to do with support and being able to listen and provide that. Absolutely. That listening piece is crucial for us to be able to do that. Thank you. Right. Who haven't we heard from yet? I think there are four people left. Um, I can go. Mine is, uh, I'm, I'm an assistant professor, I told you, on, uh, from the literacy education program in CNI department, and mine is quite service level, <laughs> because um, I feel belonged when I go to grocery stores, like um, Asian grocery stores, mostly, um, HMARS, like Korean grocery stores, I can read and I can, I can definitely see uh, what those are and what ingredients are in those like products. And I, I feel belong and there are K-pop turning on and <laughs> I usually feel, oh, maybe this is my place. And I feel comfortable here, um, yeah, HMARS and like Japanese grocery store, Mitsuwa or so. So I really like uh, living here because there are plenty of those places around here. Awesome. Good to hear. Thanks for sharing. All right, Razak, it looks like you're up. All right. I think I'll take it from where we 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 all shared, especially with Farah. I hope I got the name correct. Yes. So I'm looking at it from three angles. Um, the feeling of being accepted and included, and also the meaningful connections that I make with people, especially with the faculty that I've met so far and I keep meeting. Um, one person, Sally, anytime she'll meet you, is like, Razak, we want you here. <laughs> and that, and that, 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 those messages, those words alone makes you feel like, okay, where you are, you are needed. You are want, not, you're not just wanted, but you are needed. That is one. And also any time that I get opportunity to meet Sally, meet Mike, meet um, Eric and all the wonderful faculty, they are readily available. So I feel a sense of um, the one they have, I have a listening ear. I have people to go to. People who are readily available to me, and also not only that, the connection that I make with these people, um, I feel more connected. Like I can pick up a phone and call. And it's like, okay, what can I do to support you? So that is how I feel that sense of belonging. I feel like I've not felt it as much as in other places, and. I love it here, and I think we are doing a great job on that. Awesome, good to hear. I'm hearing a lot of um, your example, Razak, is about like validation, right? It's not just knowing who you are, but it's hearing that your work and you are of value. 
Right. Thanks for sharing that. All right, Christy and Trish. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute and everything too <laughs> and eat lunch. So yeah, everything. Um, I think for me, it's, well, for sure, family, family and friends is where I think everyone feels the most, you know, you know, uh, safe <laughs> and at their best. But I also think when it comes to a work environment, it's more, and I'm a supervisor. So mine, I'm thinking of my kiddos, my students in the classrooms. I think it has to do with a lot of with like how they're feeling and if they're safe with their own students. And when you have your own students, I also think it's getting to know them more on a personal level. Not just great job, you did really great on that lesson plan, more of how are you? How was your weekend? Do you have a, like, what'd you do this weekend? You know, all of that and getting to know people more on a personal level, I think always creates like a better sense of belonging, so. Relationship maintenance and connectivity. For sure. Mm, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree what Trish said. For me, it's those that have not necessarily just a personal interest, but goes beyond just professional and why we're here, able to be comfortable and sharing um, what's important to me, which is about my family, finding those that have, you know, similar ideas as well. So just being able to feel comfortable enough to share my thoughts and feelings about things, having a safe space uh, really helps me feel belonging, um, you know, at, at, at the office type of thing. It's really another important factor too, that sense of like comfort. And is this space safe enough for me to share who I really am? Thanks for sharing, Christy. We want to talk to you about the how we're structuring this conversation today. And so this is going to be an interactive panel where we discuss some of the salient themes of the book. So we'll be discussing things like belonging and belonging uncertainty and promoting inclusivity and so on. But we want to let you know up front that what we're going to do is ask you some questions as an audience first, listen to you process it, and then only after that will we kind of talk about what we were gleaning from the book as panelists. We'll then end with kind of like a Q&A session so that we can kind of prime and generate more ideas about how we can serve the college and university as well. Uh, you should also know that everybody's gonna have access to this PowerPoint. And so later on, we won't spend time on this now, but these are some important points and ideas from the book that can also help us think about how am I working towards cultivating belonging in classrooms with students, building relationships uh, with friends, family, and colleagues as well. So here's the first question of the hour. Belongingness is in the context of academics, sometimes criticized as like this nebulous concept, but I think we've already done a little bit of unpacking with it. I wanna hear just from you a little bit more. What are your thoughts about defining belonging and why it's an important concept here within the university and in the College of Education? Um, so we'll stop the share again and just put some of your thoughts in the chat or we can have a conversation out loud, but we'd like to hear from our audience on this one. What is belonging and why is it important in the context of the universe and the College of Education? And again, panelists will respond, but we only want to after we have some of your thoughts from the audience. First. Here are the questions in the chat. Daryl, go for it. Um, so the metaphor that someone shared with me once I thought was really powerful is, um, because we have this issue of like minoritized communities or marginalized communities and folks from there are like, you know, are you have get accepted to go to a college campus with this first generation or racial like whatever. Um, and yet there's like this question of like still being having challenges even once they've been accepted. And someone shared the metaphor with me of there's a difference between being invited to the party versus being asked to dance. Um, and so if someone's just like being here on campus, that's not going to necessarily mean they thrive here. When they get here, they have a sense of, well, this isn't really for me or people here aren't really like me or I don't belong. And so I think this question of belonging is central to how do we help everybody succeed here, right? So if someone looks like me, um, you know, like a traditionally like white middle-class male, like, like academia is made for me. And so like, I don't even have to think on a certain level about my sense of belonging in the same way someone who doesn't look like me does. And so I think that's one of the reasons it's hugely important. Yeah, it's a, thank you for bringing that up, Daryl. We know that uh, from like the book and some other spaces that it's context specific, right? Meaning that our intersectional identities are always going to have a significant impact of whether we feel like this, say, this space is safe, inviting, um, or welcoming to who we are. 
Anybody else from the audience want to share some thoughts about why belonging is important in a college context with colleagues or students? Okay, so I think that's probably a good start from what we've heard so far. We know that Chris, um, David, and Joe are going to talk to us a little bit about some of their reactions. Um, I kind of was reviewing the book uh, over the weekend to kind of prepare for this, doing my doing my homework. And I think one of the points that stood out to me the most about belonging and why it's important is could also be touched on by the folks who are going to talk about belonging and certainty. But the, some of the studies that they did on belonging said that the brain processes like rejection and a lack of belonging in much the same way that it processes physical pain. And I think that was one of the standouts to me was that it's not just a feeling that you don't belong is an emotional gut punch um, and emotionally, but like it, your body doesn't necessarily know the difference between not belonging and being slapped in the face. Really. There's a similar like physiological reaction, which I think that that's kind of interesting. It's both fascinating and heartbreaking. So I think that was one of the things that stood out to me is, um, is that was the, the the main thing that stood out to me. There were a couple others, but I've been known to dominate conversations. So I'm going to see if anyone else has something to say. Hey, sir. Yeah, kind of building on that, I think all, all of what Joe just articulated stuck out to me as well. And, and kind of paired with that, I think in a lot of the spaces in the book that are discussed, the way that the margin between feeling that sense of belonging and not feeling it is so razor thin and can be tipped one way or the other so easily um, that it it kind of makes it an important concept because we can be unintentionally tipping in that lack of belonging, belonging uncertainty, and you know e even further beyond those so easily in just regular interactions, regular interactions between an instructor and a student, between coworkers, between a supervisor and an employee, all of those margins are so thin that we have to approach it with a lot of intentionality uh, if we care about that, cultivating that sense of belonging, uh, which I, I think we all do. Um, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd add uh, great comments by Joe and Chris. I'd also add kind of a personal nuance to what the book was saying. So, so what I do one of the things I do here in the college is I work with all of our 2,500 students, half our undergrad, half our grad. Most of the grad students um, are adult learners and they're here not during traditional business hours, eight to 4.30. They're here usually at nights, on weekends, off campus, certainly. Um, so I do see a few more undergraduate students and where they are developmentally, developmentally, 18 to 22, usually they're here from 8 to 4.30, a lot of them. Um, the sense of belonging comes up and um, just kind of one of the areas I've taken from the book and incorporated over the years into my own practice is um, kind of what Q was getting at, um, a sense of validation. I hear you, I see you, I respect you. And that last part, respect, beyond my words, what are my actions? What are my physical attributes? You know, am I like, I don't know if you can see me I'm like this with my arms crossed at, you know, being very aware of the messages that seeing, being aware, very aware of what message my appearance sends. And then also I, I talk to students you know, who, do you have a community? Do you have a person? Do you have people here on campus, off campus, job, relationships, uh, intramural sports, let's say, playing the band, uh, someone in class, maybe it's an instructor, someone you feel that has your back here. And then secondly, a sense of belonging. What's your, as a friend say, what's your raison d'etre? What's your reason for getting up and functioning here at Northern in the College of Ed, in a certain program, in a certain department? to turn the assignments in, to go to class, um, to engage, so on and so forth, and start thinking about the world you're living in and, and creating in that sense of belonging. Don't know if it's always successful, but um, get some pretty insightful feedback from students about some of those questions and engaging in that initial conversation, um, which I do believe links to, to this book. They may not have overtly said that, but um, 
I really liked, again, what Joe and uh, Chris were saying. A lot of the studies kind of validated, at least in my mind, uh, um, you know, some of the things we're trying here in the departments and College of Ed, we're, we're on to something where we're moving in a positive direction, I believe. Yeah, and so important to reiterate that it's a fundamental criteria for success. And I think what the, one of the things that I was also resonating with, with both what everybody was saying was that it's kind of like this fragile state of being, right? Like moments in conversations with people can support it or undermine it, but every moment is an opportunity. There Anybody else? From... Sorry, Go ahead, Joe. There's a metaphor in one of the earlier chapters of the book where they talk about how belonging um, can be, there's like a weather metaphor that is associated with belonging, where there are elements of the weather that we, and a person's sense of belonging that are outside of our control. Um, what happened to them before they got into our office or into our classroom, what's going to happen to them after, what's going on in 14 other classes that they might be involved in, um, their their past, their history, their, uh, like all these other things that are not in, con in our control are, in, are a factor of it. But what could, but what trying to give that sense of belonging to our students and our colleagues is, is the uh, meteorological equivalent of hats, gloves, scarves, um, a desk to hide under in a tornado, um, all those different things. Like we can't control whether there's a tornado or not, but we can make sure that they know that we have a desk in our office if they need it. So I think, and I think that was another thing that it was, it's never one thing that we can do that will make or break it. It's a million things that we're not conscious that we're doing that we need to be conscious of doing them more often that will bridge that gap because if they need to feel like they belong because they're having a bad day today, there's nothing you can do today about it. It's what you've been doing for the, the prior sem the semester up until that point that is going to make them feel like I'm having the bad day. And now I know where to go as opposed to, oh, I'm going to be here for you now that you need me. It's like you weren't there when I didn't, you didn't make it known that you were there before. So I think that's the, the key thing about belonging to me is it's never, we're never done. It's always ongoing. Um, and it's something that needs to constantly, it needs to be tended. It's not something that we create and set it and forget it. We create it, maintain it, build it, tweak it, modify it. It's different for this student than that student. And we need to do our best to try to meet everyone where they're at. Which requires listening, something that we need to also do as a part of that process. That, yes. I, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. So this is for our audience. What do you think are general threats to student and staff sense of belonging? So we're about to start talking about belonging and certainty with our panelists, but when you just think about what threatens people's sense of belonging, what are the types of conditions or events that threaten somebody's sense of belonging? And again, we can put those in the chat or talk about those out loud, up to you. Uh, I think when you don't feel as though you're being heard, that can really hurt your sense of belonging. If you make comments in a meeting, comments in a class, and there's no follow-up, no connective tissue to the next thing that's said, it's just you say something and then the whole world moves, seems to move on, and it's like you didn't say anything at all. I think that can really be like, okay, I don't belong here. I'm not making an impact of any kind. And I think, too, going off that... Um... It's not, I don't think belonging is just about one specific interaction. So if you think of you're on a college campus, yes, you might have a positive, you know, faculty student or staff student uh, relationship and encounter. But if that's not being echoed across the entire campus, that could ultimately, I think, be a threat to a student if they're only having maybe a good experience with one faculty member, but in another class, they might not feel that same sense of belonging. So I think it kind of has to be more of like a holistic effort in terms of the overall campus environment, not necessarily just the communication you're having with one or two faculty or staff members. See a lot of heads nodding there. I'm also seeing in the chat dishonest communication or clear bias among individuals definitely threatens somebody's sense of connectivity and belonging. And then also fear of failing. I 
Anybody else? All right, then our panelists, Suzanne and Bess, are going to talk to everybody a little bit about what it means, belonging uncertainty, and what the reactions were from the book here. Well, as the book described it, um, belonging uncertainty can reflect a situation that some see as idyllic, but can be infused with danger to others. It's that sense that you somehow have to be extra vigilant. You're on the lookout for what's going on around you because you feel so uncertain in your belonging in that room. Um, some of the things that come up are stereo stereotype threat, where folks are on the lookout and vigilant about not confirming negative stereotypes if they're part of a marginalized group. That can heighten that sense of not fitting in, not being like the other people in the room, which makes you feel you don't belong. That's one aspect of it. And in the context of the university, um, we can think about our, you know, the marginalized populations that we would think about in lots of contexts, you know, based on race or socioeconomic um, status. But um, we also might think about the different hierarchies that are inherent in academia, um, like pre-tenure versus post-tenure faculty or um, tenure track faculty versus instructors or faculty versus staff. And um, in our discussions um, as a group in the book club, um, one of the things that stuck out to me was how we introduce ourselves in a meeting where we say like our name and our title. And um, that, that automatically puts people in boxes and develops that hierarchy. So what would it sound like if we had meetings where we didn't automatically say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm a full professor and, oh, I'm, you know, an advisor. And, and we didn't perpetuate those um, kind of almost class differences within academia. Yeah, and that's an excellent point because that, it's not just our students that we need to focus on, it's also one another. And are we creating that sense of partnership with those people we're working with? Um, you know, research suggests, you know, help students build partnerships. I think it was David that talked about being someone's person. We all need to feel like we have an ally um, and there's ally math that two allies in a classroom means one satisfied um, either supervisor or student and to recognize the importance of, of diminishing that sense of otherness, differentness, whether it's hierarchy based on the academic world we live in, or if it's students who are different, just being aware that belonging, as I think it was Joe said, is not something that can, that, that's a permanent state. It can change so quickly. And so when you walk into a room with folks, you know, how do you introduce yourself? How do you, what assumptions are you making? We have that fundamental attribution error where we're blaming people versus recognizing circumstances that surround them. You know, we, we're hired to do a job, this is our title. It's not because we're not able to do something. Maybe the position we're in, maybe our experience doesn't allow us to be as agentic as we need to be or would like to be. So just kind of being aware, what is it I'm bringing to a situation with folks that's gonna invite or send out? folks from that sense of belonging and that togetherness. And thanks for bringing that up. And then uh, as a topic that I think we can all maybe also address is what are some strategies from the book that we've learned that can help us address either us versus them thinking hierarchies and belonging uncertainty? For me, I was thinking of situation crafting and so the book talked about this idea that we're all Pygmalions of other people's situations and that idea or that references that were basically like architects of people's belonging, whether that's with colleagues or students or other staff. And so the ways that we address our relationships and invite them into conversations and listen to them can play a significant role in diminishing their sense of belonging and certainty. But if you also think about hierarchy in our meetings, if that means that some people with more seniority get to speak more, then we should also be thinking about what are the processes that we can build in place to allow people with less seniority or power to also have a voice. That's gonna look different in different spaces, 
But one of the big takeaways of the book is we have the power to craft situations so that we can make sure that other voices are heard and that other people are being seen. You know, one of the easy tips is to learn, if you're an instructor, faculty member, learn the names of your students, learn how to pronounce them. Because if you can't, if you don't know who your student is, how on earth are they going to feel they belong? And the same way, if you uh, oversee a large group of people, know who people are, learn what matters to them beyond the work situation. We have to think about the whole student, the whole employee. To feel a sense of belonging, you've got to feel that all aspects of you are welcome in this space. And so find out about you know, what, what drives students. Assume students are motivated and, and work with them as if everyone was on the same page and let the, invite them in to the greater picture of the classroom. And, and doing, doing check-ins at the beginning of class or at the beginning of a meeting um, to, um, to build that sense of community. Um, that, so it goes beyond the business, but goes beyond the classroom and, and really brings people into a sense of, um, of what you're talking about. And then another important thing um, is, is acknowledging a misstep. You know, all of us are going to misstep. All of us may say something. We may be having the bad day and we may do something that doesn't show the respect or doesn't do the invitation, uh, inviting in the way we would like to. Acknowledging you're human, you made a mistake is the best way. Pretending like it didn't happen just to, invalidates that experience you had with that person. And it also makes the person feel like you just you, you, you run us over and you don't recognize what you're doing. So honesty, authenticity, and warmth are so important. And modeling how to acknowledge and try to have some kind of restoration for mistakes that are made is also important because it shows not only do they belong, but they matter, which is essential. Yeah, it's an important part of relationship maintenance there, seeing and valuing. Joe, looks like you have your hand raised for reaction. Yeah. Um, one of the things that had stick, I remember reading it the first time and then I was kind of looking through the whole book over the weekend is like the missed thank you. There's a, where they talk about unbelonging uncertainty, they talk about how the missed thank you is such a big deal. Um, it It's much simpler than dealing with uh, institutional hierarchies and all that other stuff, which does need addressing, but um, a student does good work on a paper and they don't feel as though that was acknowledged other than the letter grade. Um, a colleague does something that they feel was taken for granted. That those small little moments are that like mate that relationship maintenance piece that can make and those are that's the razor thin margin that Chris was talking about is soon as having a middling day and then they get that very simple very small compliment or that very minor thank you that can make that can suddenly turn the tide of okay I'm what I'm doing here matters. It, it's value. Yeah, I think I remember that quote. It was like small gestures like acknowledgement and thoughtful feedback can have a profound impact on fostering and maintaining belonging. Right. Thanks, Joe. All right. One of the other things I wanted to talk about, too, is some of the research that we've done with our own students within the College of Education. Uh, regardless of identity, many of them had said at one point that the feedback that we give them sometimes can create a sense of belonging and certainty. And so this is a segue into our next question. Question three, in what ways do you think feedback with either students or peers could threaten or support their sense of belonging? Or have you seen from your own experience how feedback could threaten or support student sense of belonging? Carolyn. I, I, I would say absolutely. I've seen how no student feedback does not support their sense of belonging. Students love feedback. Um, they love to see that the work that they put into writing a paper was read and it was read critically and thoughtfully by someone. And, and I will say when I, you know, in, in looking at evaluations, that is one of the biggest things students say is, is I received wonderful feedback. And I I, th I think that makes them feel that, yeah, this is a sense of we're partnering together to get this job done. 
Thanks for sharing. Other reactions to that question? Joe, looks like you had something there. Yeah, I can just say it out loud. Mm -hmm. um, students come into my office and they're talking about a class that they're struggling with. Sometimes they'll talk about like, but the teacher's really working with me to help me understand better. And I know that I can keep, I'm going to be able to pass the class and do better by the end. But sometimes what they get is I can't get anything right in that class. So I'm, why do I, why should I even bother anymore? I haven't seen the feedback that they get. I don't have access to that. But is, if that feedback was a little bit more, for lack of a better term, constructive, like, okay, here's where you're getting it right. Here's where you're getting it wrong. Here's how to bridge that gap, like something. Still holding the student accountable for what they do and don't get right, but also like motivating them to keep focusing on doing better next time. It can't just be critical, it sounds yeah. like. I also Beth? think that in our feedback, we sometimes um, use insider language. Um, so we use the jargon of our discipline um, or even of higher education um, without explaining it to people who might not be in our inner circle. And um, that can also create a sense of not belonging to our group if we um, if we aren't using like inclusive language and if we aren't explaining what we mean, um, we're just assuming that kids know what that means. Even something like office hours, um, if we haven't explained what office hours are, you know, they might not under you know stu first generation students, students who go to college might not really know what we mean. Yeah, good point. And we wanted to also share with you one of the big picture ideas from the book known as Wise Feedback. So just an introduction, but uh, Chris, Joe, and David want to talk about what the book was telling us about how feedback can be supported. Yeah, so <clears throat> the book talks really specifically about this idea of wise feedback, which gets a little bit into what Joe was kind of talking about with the way that feedback can be constructive, but I think it it also is looking at the idea of acknowledging a student's potential. So a lot of feedback that isn't framed in that wise way that they're talking about tends to be, this is what was incorrect on this particular assignment or task. But the student doesn't get that idea that the instructor sees them enough to believe that they can succeed. And so without that element, they tend to fall into that loop that Joe mentioned of, well, I can't do anything right. And so it, it's a matter not of what did they get right or what did they get wrong or, you know, how do they approach revision or how do they approach the next assignment? It becomes they are shutting down even the attempt of it because they don't feel that they belong in the conversation with that particular material. Um, there was a, uh, Cohen, the, the author, uh, along with some other folks, did a study with some eighth grade students writing an essay one group of students, the feedback on the essay from the teacher was prepped with a really generic, something along the lines of like, I'm giving you these comments so that you will have feedback on the assignment. And very flat, that's it. The other group of students got similar feedback, but they're at the framing of it included the idea, let me see, I have the exact language. I'm giving you this criticism because I have very high expectations and I know that you can reach them. And the gap in students who took the opportunity to revise and approach the work again from the ones who got the kind of generic flat framing versus the ones who had that potential, the wise feedback was huge, especially um, among marginalized students, minoritized students, uh, like a, a massive jump. I think it was something like 17% to 62% uh, who actually engaged with the material again, engaged with the assignment again, and felt that ability to try again. They didn't shut down in that way that Joe was talking about. Um, and so I, I thought that study was particularly powerful in kind of reinforcing it's a small language shift. The feedback itself isn't what's at issue. It's just how we're kind of queuing it up for our students. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That that was a really cool study. And um is is Q is he still here? Or are you still there? Yeah, there you are. Sorry. Um I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to a while back? Did you have a comment? 
Yeah, I just want to like chime in real quick. I think when you're sharing around, you all are sharing some pieces around feedback. One of the things that um, that just I share with my students last, la literally last night in class was I give video feedback um, to my students. And so one of the things that I do in the work is I share my screen and I go through and I talk with the students. And I was really curious from the students last night about their about their experiences, particularly in a master's course. And a lot of the things that the students shared that they felt that not only was humanizing, but they also felt like it felt like a conversation between them and their work, where oftentimes we end up just giving students, you know, track comments and giving overarching feedback. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to share with them was that writing is a really personal It's a really personal, really intimate process. And oftentimes students just see it as a product. And I told them that the feedback from a video perspective is a process. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to share, I think that it's really important that we often think about other ways to give feedback to students that often are just not in a written, you know, bleeding the red ink, um, you know, th th throughout a document, but what are some ways around we can have a conversation with students about their work that they can also take in as something that's tangible. So just wanted to share those pieces. Thank you. And pardon me, Q, I referred to you as an improper pronoun. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so so I'm gonna go back to the my own personal experience, way back time machine. <laughs> Started doing this back in the 90s. And um, my recollection in the, at least the places I was at 30 years ago, we weren't having these conversations on belonging, wise feedback, things of that nature. And, um, you know, it was basically what Q was saying and Chris and others. Uh, unfortunately, back in that era, we were just using red ink literally and, and finding fault with everything. You didn't follow the rubric, et cetera, et cetera. You know, David, you got a D. This is, this is your lot in life or, or, Carolyn, you got an A, you know, wonderful job. And um, I was I was on a committee and, and we had a, a student that just shared with our committee. Um, I taught also taught a class called uh, Dialogues on Diversity. Who, um, and we were um, discussing W.E.B. Du Bois work and stuff. And the student felt comfortable enough to come to this committee and say, in their own words, I, I don't think people here see me for who I am. And it was a student of color uh, because the feedback I always get is just so damaging to my psyche and who I am as a person. There's there's nothing here for me other than negativity. And they even point out, and for crying out loud, it feels like it's the 1950s and this was the mid 90s. It's in red ink. And that always stuck with me. And I you know, wasn't always a... <laughs> real good at this, but try to, uh, in the subjects I taught along the way is try to give, I didn't know the term wise feedback or wise criticism at the time, but try to, try to, as Chris was saying, that's a great quote. I, I just found it's on page 224 about, I know what we're learning is really hard. I know that. And, but we have really high standards and I know that potential you have. And I found in my own career, that's you know, for the most part, really worked really well. And people have really engaged in that saying like, yeah, um, some of this criticism might be hard, but it's, I know you have potential. I can see it. We want to get you to that, to that level where we can realize that potential. And another a quote, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown, clear as kind. Eric hears me say that a lot. And I've really tried to incorporate that in my work and in my teaching and on dissertations, clear as kind. Kind of the same idea with wise criticism, wise feedback, um, wise critique, whatever we want to call it, is I know you have high potential. You can reach that higher heights. This conversation you know, is meant to be kind, but it's going to, you know, some maybe touch on a few areas where one needs to develop and stuff. And I've I found in my own personal life that seemed to have worked really well. Rather than I used to do the generic, you know, hey Q, great job. You got a 99 out of a hundred. You, you know, you didn't get the best out of me. You did a wonderful job, or oh, you got a 59 out of a hundred and you didn't really learn. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was a really, really great part of the book, at least for me as a professor. Yeah, and then we, I think there's also um, a utility for being able to use this type of framework with conversations with peers as well, right? Anybody have any thoughts about that? What would this look like with colleagues or staff? 
Um, I can talk a little bit about something along those lines. Um, I I have a there's a volunteer group that I do a lot of work with, and a couple of years ago we were in a meeting. It was all staff. We were trying to sort out a new thing that we were going to try to do for this youth group, and I throughout the whole meeting I just kept like pointing out like, well, have we thought about how if this goes wrong or if that goes wrong? And I felt like I was bringing down the room. Um, afterwards, I talked to one of like the directors. I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. I know that I was kind of the Debbie Downer and all this. And he took the second. He goes. Why do you think we invite you? You're the one who can point out where all the different, you never tell us not to do something. You're always pointing out, this is where it, this is where it could be different. This is, have we considered this and we consider that and it's always better. He could have just as easily said, don't worry about it, it's fine. But he took the time to show what, how, what I was doing, which was clearly causing me a level of uncertainty, how it was benefiting the group and why I should keep doing it. So the, the feedback version is, don't worry about it, it's fine. The wise feedback version is what you're doing is contributing to the team. Please keep it up. So I think that's the why that's a very, and that wasn't a, a very, that took him four seconds. It wasn't a thing that he had a pre-plan. It was a, it was not anything that was documented. It wasn't very official. It was a very casual off the cuff. Here's how you, here's how you're, what you're doing is right and benefiting us. Please keep it up. And that made me feel so much more comfortable speaking up in these meetings when I had something negative to say um, because I, I knew that it was being valued. So for a colleague who's maybe having a hard time speaking up in a meeting or made a point in a meeting that wasn't necessarily adopted as a practice, but still made the point, that type of feedback of like, hey, I, that was a really good idea. I appreciate you bringing it up. Whether you're their supervisor or not, hearing that someone else in the room heard and acknowledged and connected with what you said that's going to make that person, at the very least, between the two of you, you can't speak to the overall space, that's going to help that relationship and make that feel like they belong with you, at the very least. Great points there. I remember reading about things like identity priming, too, where it's like we can remind people about their values or how they've acted before and say, you've done this before, uh, I know we can get back here again, right? Like here are your original values or here are the values of the department. You can use that and wise feedback too. Okay, we're running out of time but we have two questions left. So here is the next one for us. In what ways can we promote belonging across diverse groups at NIU, ensuring that inclusivity happens for our students of color and majority students? This one's for the audience first. Any ideas here? I think this is a hard one. It took a lot of thought for us too, even when we were looking around the book. Um, I have a, a thought on this one. Um, I think a lot of this so this is me speaking as, as an instructor in courses like a faculty teaching students, right? Um, a lot of the work for me has been around recognizing, part of my recognizing where I get a sense of belonging from um, is, is recognizing also that like the kinds of students that I feel a sense of belonging with and the kinds of, I have less of a sense of a belonging with. And we have, a, we like most people have a tendency to gravitate towards the people that feel familiar to them. And so that happens around race, it can happen around gender, happen around sexual, happen around all sorts of things. And so I think as faculty, we need to sort of understand the, the groups that we tend to gravitate towards and make a conscious effort to say, okay, well, I need to gravitate towards other students as well and include them because I can't let my own need for a sense of belonging get in the way of my responsibility to reach out to others in the classroom who might not automatically feel a sense of belonging with me. Great points. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would also think sometimes I think I look I've always felt that belonging feels more of a process than a product. And I think that oftentimes people look at belonging as a goal and as like the goal pulse. Um, kind of similar to what happened this weekend with Vanderbilt and how they broke the goal post and they, you know, shipped it over to the to, into the um uh and into the water. But I think oftentimes we look at belonging as we've arrived at it. Um, this is something that we've met. Where I often think that we have to look at the process, not the product. And so oftentimes belonging, to me, I think it's is is it's obtainable. But I think oftentimes we look at it as aspirational. 
Um, and so I think we have to also be mindful that, um, that we have to look at this as a process. It's my work as a practitioner, even as a faculty member, oftentimes belonging happened when the student left my space. Um, it wasn't necessarily what happened. Maybe what happened in that space might have been meaningful for them in those different ways, whether it's supporting them through mental health or supporting them in their academics. But oftentimes I look at belonging, like what happens to the student after they, le they, they leave our space and leave our preview? Um, where do they feel connected after those other spaces? Where I think that we often need to look at that as the process um, that we're helping them along, we're shepherding them to a different part of where there are versus where they saw where they first when they came to us originally, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Bess, what are your thoughts here? Uh, the only thing I would, I, I mean, I love both of those answers so much. Um, and I think that um, as a, as a department chair and also as an instructor, it's a lot about like listening and, um, and opening up space for, for everyone to express um, views and their perspectives. Um, and, um, you know, as we said earlier, admitting when you make a mistake and moving forward. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think y'all, you really hit the points that I was going to say. I think the only other thing I can think of so far is that we've often talked about situation crafting processes for either classroom activities or with the way that we may run meetings, but we always have to also work on collaboration over competition. So how are we getting people to come up with solutions together collectively? Uh, how are we getting people to have conversations like these where we chew on ideas instead of saying that there's one right way, right? So the more that we can implement collaboration uh, according to Cohen, the better the the sense of belonging across communities become. All right, and now last question. What lessons from the book can we apply to make NIU's workplace culture more welcoming for staff members who might feel marginalized? So this one is uh, Chris and Suzanne are gonna talk to us about this one. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, a couple of things that, that folks have mentioned already, I, I think kind of fit into my thoughts on this. Um, there's a quote early on in the book where Cohen's sort of defining belonging. Uh, and the, the actual, the beginning part of the definition is all stuff we've been hitting on already, but the end part I think is what really sticks out to me. So he says, belonging is the feeling that we're part of a larger group that values, respects, and cares for us and to which we feel we have something to contribute. And so that contribution back, I think, is a, a big part of this definitionally, but it also gets to some of what Q was talking about, that idea of it's about the process, not the product, right? And the way that we build a sustainable process for all of us from a workplace standpoint is creating sense of belonging across the board because then we are also all continuing to contribute to that sense of belonging. And so it's not just an atmosphere that one day we've created for the campus workplace. It's my sense of belonging is driving me to contribute to other people's sense of belonging. And that's driving them to contribute to other people's sense of belonging. And then it becomes self-sustaining in that way. Um, and so I, I think for me, that speaks to just the need for us to really approach this intentionally uh, in a range of interactions. Obviously, we're all in higher ed, so we tend, I think, to think about students first. We tend to say, let's worry about student belonging, but that also matters internally for us as colleagues and coworkers uh, that we begin to create that because that will also trickle down to the students as well. If we have a that sense of belonging for us collegially, then we're also going to have that uh, directed towards students. Yeah, I... I... I, yeah, Chris said a lot of things that were running through my mind. I think some of the things we've said earlier today, one, it's about social bonds. We really need to prioritize and not sideline social bonds among colleagues, um, people in our units across campus. I think managers um, can even encourage, you know, kind of cross-pollinate, mix it up with folks. Having people from diverse areas work together on a problem builds a wonderful sense of value for folks. They feel validated when their expertise is being used in different ways. Um, 
One thing to remember too as supervisors is that we may be a supervisor with multiple people reporting to us, but our supervisees only have that one supervisor. This is a really important role and we have to recognize what we mean, what 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 we represent in the lives of our employees, and to make sure they all feel valued, even though we may have multiple supervisees. I think sending the message that everyone counts, everyone's opinion is valid, and valuing diversity, actively seeking out the opinions and asking people to share their thoughts or what are some ways they might approach this problem, inviting their input really helps people feel valued. Um, that that and acknowledging their growth. I, I think about we're talking about giving wise feedback to students. I think about when we give evaluations of employees, if we don't give them superior or really, really poor, if we don't give them a one or a five, we don't have to write anything. I could just give someone fours and threes or twos and give no feedback. But taking the time to give back to our the folks who look up to us or who, who look at us as their leader is super important because it's an honor for all of us who have folks who depend on us to ensure their well-being and their sense of belonging. So I do a check-in survey before each of my department meetings and I make sure that um, equal voice is given to the faculty, the staff, the instructors, and I don't differentiate when I report back what the findings are between the groups um, because I want to give everyone that equal voice in the feedback that um, we get about the health and the well-being of the department. Yeah, so important those check-ins and even if you're not reporting back to them as a whole individually saying I've heard some of these concerns how do you feel about it also helps to facilitate that connectivity again right. It's listening, but then also reporting back and mirroring what the concerns or what the thoughts and values are. Okay, we have two minutes left. And so I wanna hear just from everybody, what's something that you're gonna take away from this preliminary conversation? We have a few more workshops planned for this year. We wanna hear just some of like, what are you thinking about now that you've heard some of this discussion? Or what's something curious you're curious to know more about? Uh, I think what Q said about it being a process and not a product, it's I, I'd heard that in various forms before, but for whatever reason, this really like knocked something loose in my brain. Um, so I think that's that's gonna resonate, figure out what am I what, like. I have a month of student meetings ahead of me. Like every single one of those is an opportunity to make that student feel like they belong a little bit more. What am I doing other than just, hi, how's it going? Let's talk about your classes for spring. Anything else I can do? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Like I have nine to 10 opportunities a day to make one student feel like they belong here more. I don't know how many people get that kind of one-on-one -on -one time besides advisors. So it's a unique opportunity. So what am I doing Every string, every single one of those meetings, it's their only meeting, but it's my seventh. What else can I do? How can I be different? What's the process that I can make happen? Yeah, so important. And again, it's like that quote, those small thoughtful gestures and acknowledgement, right? Really make the world a difference. Christy's also saying, this was a good reminder of the importance of positive feedback as I'm entering the end of courses. Students now need more positivity than ever. Yeah, I agree with Joe. I think I could also do more in my classes because some of the students I remember when I told them I was traveling, the next class, these two students were like, okay, did you travel? How did it go? So like these students were making the effort to get to know a little bit more about their, their teacher. So I think I also need to do more aside, hey, how are you? How are you doing? How is the class going? To also getting to know more about their personal lives, what is going on in their lives to make them also more feel more belonged. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? I'm resonating a lot with what Bess was talking about there too, with the, the check-ins. I think I can do that more with my students and I think that can make a world of difference. It's an important reminder for me. All right, so again, everybody, I know we're at time. I wanna thank you all for joining us here today and uh, please stay tuned for um, some follow-up with the resources.
We'll get the PowerPoint with some resources and then also we'll tell you about our next session. Thanks and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.